Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Andy Cameron. Uh, I work at uh, WSP. I did help write Manual for Streets uh, 1 and 2 uh, with Tim and uh, with others like Phil Jones and Stuart Reid and Ben Castell, who's sat at the back. We were all very jealous of Ben when uh, the, the, the publication came out and the, one of the big articles in the papers, he was reported to be a shadowy change maker because he'd written this document and we always thought that was a really cool thing to be called and we just got called highway engineers and dull stuff like that. Uh, but uh, I also helped write Places, Streets and Movement, so thank you for reminding me that's 19 years old now. There must be a 20-year anniversary coming up for that as well. Um, so what I thought I'd uh, talk about today was a little bit uh, uh, on Manual for Streets, some thoughts of where it's worked well, where it hasn't, maybe what are some of the issues around that, uh, and then a little glimpse, uh, perhaps, into the future of where we're heading next. Uh, and as always, trying to predict the future, uh, you know you're going to be wrong, but let's have a go anyway. Uh, so here we go. I never wanted to call it Manual for Streets. I wanted to call it the Joy of Streets, which I thought was far more racy and punchy. Uh, but the Department for Transport wouldn't let us, uh, because you can't have documents called the Joy of Streets going out to design streets. But instead it was trying to, uh, uh, I suppose, embody some of the ethos behind it, that we should be celebrating streets much more. Uh, and actually, you know, realising these are places for uh, public, uh, you know, joy and amusement and fun, as well as conveying transport and utilities and all those practical things. Uh, and a little bit of what, uh, you know, I, I want to talk about is still that joy and perhaps how we deliver it. But the document has had uh, a lot of influence um, uh, around the world. Uh, it helped uh, with the Scottish Designing Streets uh, document, which came out uh, shortly afterwards. This is one of the first schemes in Scotland. New town for 8,000 homes in Aberdeenshire. Uh, we started with Iron Brew and Cake by putting the uh, cafe in on the square. Uh, but, you know, uh, a different way to think about street design uh, in Scotland as well. Interestingly, in Scotland, it was policy rather than guidance. So it's had far more clout in terms of uh, its usage and actually it being upheld uh, as people try and undermine it. So perhaps lessons for the future about writing guidance versus policy uh, in England and Wales uh, and Northern Ireland. Uh, Phil Jones and I also worked on the Abu Dhabi Urban Street Design Manual uh, shortly after Manual for Streets, uh, which I think had uh, plenty of influence from it. Uh, new spaces in Abu Dhabi, new you know, uh, uh, parks at the centre of communities, uh, uh, you know, little shaded alleyways, you couldn't build these before. Uh, you've actually got children riding bicycles in downtown Abu Dhabi on streets, which was unheard of before, worked very well. Uh, but even simple things like in downtown Abu Dhabi at the junctions, we tightened up the radii, put in level crossings, uh, and this happens now, cars actually stop for pedestrians. Uh, and uh, as Gulf News reported, 50% reduction in pedestrian accidents at those junctions where that was implemented. So it's had impact here as well. Uh, also, uh, uh, within their neighbours in Bahrain, this was the standard street in Bahrain several years ago, 22 metres wide, no provision for trees because it was all utilities or utility zones, uh, and then they wondered why no one would walk anymore. Uh, but uh, you go to the old parts of Bahrain, and of course they're narrow and shaded, uh, and you know, we're planning new settlements there, a new town for 5,000 people, it's proper mixed use. Uh, and here are the streets. There are streets, the little narrow walkways, and all those things that at least allow people to walk for, say, five or six months of the year when it's a bit cooler. So it's had influence in the Middle East. Uh, and further afield, one last one in uh, uh, Guatemala City. This is what, what a Guatemala City looks like. And you go into uh, gated communities and gated malls. Uh, but, uh, you know, a brand new quarter to the city here. Uh, and Manifest Streets has helped influence some of the street design uh, in terms of open fronted shopping and retail. Uh, we didn't do the levels for this. I'm sure the architect got it wrong. Uh, but a great environment for families who'll go and drink coffee there because the climate's good and the coffee's good and what have you. And so starting to rethink other places, you know, based on some of the thought process that came out of Manifest Streets. Uh, what struck me over the last, uh, you know, perhaps 20-odd years uh, is, is this stuff, you know, that we've actually got people to think about streets being the glue that hold our, you know, communities, our villages, our towns, our cities together. Uh, and realising they've got more functions than just, you know, moving people around. Uh, and a bit like Lou, you know, we want them to be multi-purpose, we want them to be for all your needs, we want them to be, well, acceptably safe, I think is, you know, part of the debate. No one's designed a totally safe street yet. Uh, uh, there's a challenge. And in thinking about this, uh, you know, it's got people to realise that they're important, which 20 years ago, I think there was less down on the agenda. It was just a job that the highway engineers went and did, but people now realise they're going to stick around for a long time.
Uh, and just to illustrate that, uh, here's uh, uh, where I live in New York-on-Trent. The marketplace uh, has got 13 routes coming into it. The pattern of that uh, square and the routes into it hasn't changed for half a millennium uh, because once it's laid down, it tends to hang around for a long time. This is the butter market building. This is the square where people still trade. Uh, we don't hang people uh, there anymore. We stopped that recently, but here it is now. Uh, and, you know, it's exactly the same uh, street pattern and movement pattern that it was 500-odd uh, years ago. Uh, and the buildings have all changed, apart from this one. There's actually a 15th century timber building has stayed in there. And I think people have started to realise that, you know, when we lay down the street pattern, it's going to be around for a long time. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is where we always upset architects by telling them your building won't last as long as my street pattern, because generally it won't. Uh, so actually we should get the street pattern right and the dimensions of it and the heights of the buildings, even though they may change, because that's going to have a longevity and that's important. I think the place and movement idea has stuck well from Manual for Streets. This idea that those are two dimensions, we need to think not just about movement, but about the place quality as well. You know, we can have bits of highway that are, you know, 7.3 metres wide, but if the buildings don't face it, uh, if cars drive along here at uh, 60 or 70 as they try to, it's not going to create a good place. Uh, but we can take that same bit of tarmac, we can add parking and buildings and life, uh, and suddenly it becomes, you know, a high street or part of a community uh, that has got slow speeds, people can get across the street, uh, and we get that place dimension coming in. And these are my favourite two slides uh, because, uh, you know, here's one that breaks a bit of guidance. It's not wide enough for two cars to get past each other. And I love debating this with highway engineers who tell me we can't have that. You can't have somewhere where it isn't wide enough for two cars to get past each other. Uh, and yet this is uh, up in Scotland, uh, in Perthshire, and it works perfectly well and has done for a couple of centuries before cars turned up. And these people, you know, they flash their lights or they wave at each other and they don't drive into each other because they're not maniacs, you know, they're like the rest of us, they're good civil human beings. So why not? Why can't we do this? Because this seems to deliver a lot of good things uh, in terms of good street design. And as Tim mentioned, you know, we've tried to move away from this idea of having a whole host of standardised geometric criteria uh, because, of course, all that leads to uh, are standardised layouts. And that was a deliberate, a very deliberate, I, I think, strategy from the drafting team and from the people who were consulted in the document, was not to have a prescriptive document uh, to actually say, let's try and get people to go and think for themselves. And I think that's had mixed success. We can talk about that later uh, and, and perhaps some of the reasons. And that was the tricky one. It was, you know, the, uh, this idea of, of trying to not be too prescriptive. I think it was a little bit like a directive from Donald Trump, uh, you know, everyone just ignored it, uh, rather than saying, let's try and do this. Uh, so, uh, but it has worked in places. Uh, at Poundbury, where I've worked for 20-odd years now, uh, you know, a lot of what was done there was trying to uh, you know, move away from standardised guidance and actually create streets and squares and places uh, I'll, 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 I'll coincide with Tim on some of the architecture, but uh, I'm not responsible for that. Uh, but places where uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the creation of place came first uh, rather than the placing of roads. And a lot of that came back to one simple little diagram, uh, which I still think is one of the most important in the document, uh, from Leon Creer saying, you know, we mustn't have that kind of roads first, then place the buildings around it, but actually we should think about the placing of the buildings and then make the streets fit in between. And I think a lot of the places we show where manual streets hasn't worked, I think that's where that approach is still going wrong. It's still a roads-first approach, uh, rather than really getting a good design team on board, thinking about that third dimension, what sort of spaces are the buildings going to create. Um, so what might have worked? Well, um, I think there's been certainly a take-up of manual for streets by some of the more progressive house builders, perhaps some of the smaller house builders. I think the design community, uh, you know, we're hopefully amongst friends here today, have accepted that there's some good ideas there. We're definitely in a better place than DB32. And I think one of the great things we managed was to kill off DB32. It was withdrawn. Uh, and so if you know of local authorities who are still using it or referring to diagrams in it, uh, then uh, they should be informed of that. There's also quite a good uh, collection of uh, appeals now where they've lost based on the fact they're using old guidance that's been superseded. Uh, some local authorities are struggling, I think Tim's right, with the recession, with the cutbacks uh, in staff and training, uh, that's made things difficult. Uh, but many have taken on 
uh, you know, recommendations for local street guidance. Some are still reluctant to change, uh, but there's more stuff on the ground now, and I'll show you some images, which hopefully is you know, spreading the word. But in the future, perhaps we need a better minimum level of design advice. Did we not give enough within the document? Should there be some really basic, uh, you know, here's how to do a square, how to do a, uh, a boulevard diagrams? Do we need more training? Do we get, need to get people to go and see more stuff? Do we need to refuse more applications for poor design? Uh, you know, where's the, uh, th that kind of veto and say this just isn't good enough, uh, you know, refusal, refusal not going to happen, but then we've got to build 300,000 houses a year, allegedly. Uh, and then anyone for proper mixed use, I'll touch on that uh, in a second. Um, but here are some uh, things which I think are, are interesting. This is in Cornwall, and uh, you know, lots of new streets with no footways, uh, suds integrated within the development, lots of new uh, uh, local materials being used. This is local granite, new town, 30-year programme, not importing granite from China, but actually opening up a local uh, Cornish uh, quarry uh, to bring all the granite in uh, there. Uh, again, streets uh, that are busy at times, but no footways. Everyone just does, does this down the middle. That's the traffic calming. Uh, and then interesting things with some of the details. I agree with Tim about getting the details right. Uh, you know, we're carving, or I'm not personally, but we're having the street signs carved uh, locally uh, by a college in, in Cornish, uh, and they're in slate and mounted on buildings along with lighting. Uh, and then little things, every house has a, uh, a bird box built within it. You know, how are we thinking about ecology? Uh, but other stuff, you know, good uh, striking design in Chichester here. Uh, again, very simple streets uh, in terms of materials, materials palette and, and geometry. Uh, we've seen Trumpeton already, but integration of suds, you know, into main streets. Uh, you know, just crisp detailing on some of the side streets, no footways, uh, no uh, radii. Just, you know, this is a sensible place to park. You'd park here, but we don't need to mark it out with white lines or, or tell people. Uh, Derwenthorpe in York, uh, again, uh, you know, uh, modern striking architecture, but very simple street design, uh, you know, really pinching it down to three metres, uh, slightly less in places, uh, where we've got lightly traffic streets. Uh, and here's a distributor road uh, reinvented at Upton in Northampton uh, that actually becomes a main street for, uh, you know, a new settlement. And it's got everything a main street should have. It's got tall buildings buildings that actually can flex in terms of use. People have started to turn ground floors into shops, uh, parking trees, uh, and yet it's not overly, uh, not overly wide. Um, but it's still uh, going wrong in places. Uh, this is Fernwood, which shall remain anonymous in terms of location. Uh, but, you know, streets where parking uh, obviously dominates, uh, uh, streets uh, where that problem of parking on the pavement still happens, because people feel that's the right thing to do. Lack of uh, choice of materials. Uh, you know, so many authorities with a choice of this and a curb, and that's it. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, rang me up the day to inform me that in uh, another scheme in Aberdeenshire, they now have three choices of materials. Uh, they have black top concrete curbs and yellow lines is the other one that he's allowed to use. Uh, so he was starting to despair. Uh, and then we have these things called events. Uh, you know, this is post manual streets, and uh, I'm sure this was uh, described as a square or something, but it's uh, horrific. Uh, and the most oddest-looking house uh, on the planet I've ever seen. Someone designed this. This is what kind of fascinates me. An architect. I hope it was an architect. I hope it wasn't. My, my nine-year-old daughter can design better houses than this. Uh, and then, you know, the saddest bench in all the land, which is just kind of, you know, on its own doing nothing with backs of houses. But this is, all, this is all still coming out of the ground, and this is one estate I've picked on, uh, and, you know, it's a big problem. Uh, and, you know, people have started to pick some things up. This is the same place. They've started to make it a bit more connected. You know, this stuff does join up rather than being a whole series of cul-de-sacs. Uh, but actually, uh, it's not that legible um, because all the buildings are the same. You know, this idea of actually, you know, increasing density doesn't happen. Uh, and then, uh, you know, here's this development and here's the, the business park and the school are going over here across this great big road. So we're still mixing uh, or zoning everything. We're not putting it together. And I think that's been one of the great successes of Poundbury, which often gets overlooked, is it's proper mixed use. Uh, you know, uh, about two years ago, we had 2,100 jobs to 1,500 homes, which was always the strategy, one house per job, uh, so that people could actually live and work there if they chose to do so. And what do we find at this time? There was a third of people walking and cycling to work because 
they could. Uh, businesses want to be there because the residents, their workers are happy and they can be a resident and all that. And I still think you know, one of the fundamentals of Manifest Streets was about building proper mixed use, and that really hasn't happened uh, hardly in any places at all. So a quick uh, glance to the future, just to wrap up. Uh, we need to, to be ready. Uh, these things uh, are, are, are coming, I'm sure. The autonomous vehicle or the driverless car. Uh, and uh, some of them may have, as this car on the right infers, uh, us slabs of meat in the front trying to drive. Um, but uh, it's something that um, we're pretty confident is going to be with us within the next decade in a big way. Uh, you know, it's not a new idea. Here was the first cruise control car, 1958, launched in the States, the Imperial. And we're starting to think already about how our streets may need to morph into the future. And this is some work we've done with Terry Farrells, uh, thinking about, in an AV world, uh, you know, not just the technology, but what should we do with our streets? Do we turn all that space over to more vehicle capacity? You know, do we need all these things, or should we actually rethink this is Marble Arch into a much more pedestrian-friendly place and reclaim that space for pedestrians. Uh, we had some fun with the M25 uh, in terms of, you know, will you need all this in an AV world? Uh, and actually, should it be used for power generation and yoga? I don't know. But, you know, let's have that discussion. But also the suburbs, you know, will we need, uh, you know, parking outside our homes? Will we need garages? Uh, you know, if suddenly uh, we're in a sharing world of autonomous vehicles, and again, do these suddenly start to become very different places, perhaps harder to pay for it here uh, than our city centres. And so I think what's interesting is there's change afoot, uh, and, and we need to be aware of it. Uh, and equally for new places, what are they going to be like? How should we design those to be robust? And I think already, you know, looking at 20, 30-year projects, you know, how do we build that in uh, coming forward? Uh, and uh, for those who obviously say it'll never catch on, then uh, I always love this picture of uh, uh, this chap with his mobile phone in a briefcase and a bodyguard from the city in the 80s, uh, and of course we all have them now. And so my, my thoughts are really, for the future, you know, for three things. They are about technology. I think that's going to have a huge impact on, on, on our street design. But also climate and equality are things where uh, you know, we're, we're not doing brilliantly at the moment. Uh, and I've just, uh, I have just been in China, actually, and I thought uh, useful to share what's happening in Shanghai, uh, where you know, technology, uh, dealing with things like uh, bike hire, you know, none of it's done with uh, you know, docking stations and putting your credit card in. It's all done with your phone and GPS, and you leave a bike wherever you want. 25 million people, 1.5 million bicycles. Works perfectly well. The whole city has almost gone cashless as well. Huge impact on how we shop, how we live. Huge rise in these things, electric bikes everywhere, uh, coming uh, uh, here in a big way soon, and electric scooters, uh, whole mo different modes of transport. Uh, I took this whilst on my bike trying to film, and this little guy whizzed past me on a, uh, a hoverboard. What you don't see, he's actually on his phone playing a video game at the time. So I don't know whether he programmed his route or whether it was doing it himself. But you know, these things are everywhere, coming to a city near you. Uh, and uh, you know what's missing in Shanghai? Well, they've banned uh, all the uh, uh, lorries uh, and uh, uh, diesel, petrol motorbikes are all gone. So it's an incredibly clean city. Here we are in London. You know, still suffering with lorries every day. Uh, finally, after 20 years, thinking about pedestrianising Oxford Street. Uh, you know, here's a city that's actually going places. Uh, so we should start to, to learn from these guys. And fascinating, uh, you know, just to see uh, how they're dealing with. Uh, you know, uh, information uh, for blind and partially sighted people in particular. This is the use of tactile in Shanghai, uh, you know, with guided routes, corduroy paving, tactile where you need to change direction or there's a, a crossing or what have you, and leagues ahead of our sort of outdated uh, system which is poorly implemented in this country. Uh, maybe there's another technological solution to that. And climate, you know, really tackling it. Uh, new city uh, south of Shanghai called Ningbo, 5 million people. But every street like this, huge tree-lined streets, enormous tree planting to deal with the fact temperatures are going up. Uh, you know, walkways just being shaded with bamboo, bridges being shaded and all this, really starting to tackle that whole climate issue. And so, you know, those are really some quick thoughts about perhaps where we need to think next as well. So that... Oh. <laughs> God. No, I've only got a couple more. <laughs> so there we go. Um, 
we've come a long way in 10 years. Uh, you know, the whole streets agenda, I think walking, the cycling agenda has improved massively. Manual Streets didn't really tackle cycling, uh, and that's been done by others brilliantly uh, over the years. Uh, there's still a lot to do. Ultimately, is it about this? Do we just need to build more beautiful places? Is that what will make them be loved and make them sustain? Uh, you know, uh, whether it's tree-lined, whether it's for uh, shopping, parking, you know, good markets. Uh, we need to be careful of some of the rules. Uh, this is what happened at Upton when we followed the rules for providing a local area for play. This is a lap. I've never seen anyone play in it in about 10 years. Uh, so, you know, sometimes the guidance might be wrong. Uh, but at Poundbury, kids do play in the street. Uh, here in Rotterdam, people play in the middle of the city centre. Uh, so why aren't we doing a bit more of this as well? And then finally, to finish with a quote from uh, an esteemed uh, sage, uh, no, none other than James May, from Top Gear magazine, who published a uh, whole page on Manual for Streets when we uh, launched in 2007. And most of it was, was pretty uh, derogatory against everything we were talking about. Uh, but some words of wisdom from James May, I do agree with the basic premise that streets should be social places. In fact, the street where I live already is one. So there you go, James May recognising what a street is. Uh, so that's it. Uh, let's have some more joy, like these mad Scottish people in our streets. And uh, here's to the next 10 years. Thank you.